Welcome, everybody. Tonight, we're talking about worried parents and anxious kids, how to help your student manage anxiety and improve school performance. My name is Ann Dolan, and for the last 25 years, my team of tutors and executive function coaches have been helping kids to do better in school. Um, prior to Educational Connections, I was a special ed and a regular ed teacher with Fairfax County. And um, while I was a teacher on the side, I would drive to kids' homes and tutor them. And I just fell in love with working with kids one-on-one. -on -one. So shortly thereafter, I left Fairfax County and started Educational Connections. Um, along the way, I've seen so many changes in the field of education and certainly not as no more changes than during the years of COVID. Um, and that's really why we're here tonight. You know, in my practice, kids are coming to us more anxious than ever. Kids that didn't seem to have focus issues before are having more and more difficulty focusing. So tonight we hope to solve some of those problems for you and with you. And I have an expert in the house and I'm super excited um, for you to meet Deanna Diescu. And Deanna, also who goes by Dr. D um, from the kids that she works with, is from Georgetown Psychology. She's a licensed clinical psychologist. She has a master's and a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Virginia. And um, I think super importantly, she believes that caregivers play an essential role in the process, that it really isn't just about the kids, but it's really about the parents and how they can make change. So, Diana, thank you so much for being here and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm very excited to be here. And hopefully we can um, answer some of the questions that parents have. I know that I've seen a lot of parents who have very similar questions. So we've prepared for those. And then hopefully we'll take some from the people who joined us. Yes. And that's a great point. Um, as we go along tonight, if you have a question, um, throw it in the chat. I'm happy to answer those as we go along, but we did reserve time at the end for a Q&A session with Diana. So Diana, as I mentioned, you know, go, starting off that we're seeing a lot of anxious kids at Educational Connections. And it used to be, you know, the students we saw had, you know, sometimes they just, they were the B student, they want to be the A. Sometimes they had ADHD, um, dyslexia, dysgraphia, different things going on. But it sounds, it feels more um, these days that kids are complicated, more complicated than others, than other years. And certainly when it comes to anxiety. So I'm wondering if you're seeing an anxiety, uh, an increase in childhood anxiety and what that looks like in your practice. Yes, we are certainly seeing a significant increase in childhood anxiety in our practice. And I do think, and I'm not the only one thinking this, that COVID had a lot to do with it. The pandemic has created an environmental factor that has enhanced people's anxiety, children and adults alike. And I think it's acted on several fronts. One, children saw their parents be worried. And there's a huge link between, you know, what children's perception is and then of, of their parents and then how safe they feel. Children themselves began feeling less safe. And then for children and adults who had a predisposition for anxiety, but didn't have it activated before the pandemic certainly activated that. So all of a sudden, it was like a blanket of heaviness and anxiety triggering thrown over everybody at the same time. So it also added a lot of uncertainty out into the world. So we all know we have trouble dealing with uncertainty. And that creates a lot of anxiety, even for the most laid back and calm people out there. And so wherever there was a little bit of tendency for anxiety, the pandemic, I think, managed to draw it out. Some of the main things that you're hearing from parents. So we still see a lot of parents with um, telling us about their children with depression, with ADHD, but indeed anxiety is a significant significant concern and within that there's a lot of school anxiety now because there has been so much transition you know first everybody was going to school as we all know prior to march of 2020 then schooling completely changed became you know homeschooling video schooling for everybody at the same time as their parents were trying to work and so it became this very disorganized unstructured anxiety provoking environment 
And then more recently, we have tried to transition again and get kids back into the classroom. And that's just really, really hard. So we see a lot of school related and anxiety related issues. So comorbidity between anxiety and school difficulties. And how can that impact student performance? Like really, what is the link between kids that struggle with anxiety and then sometimes have difficulty in school? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I would like to take just a couple of minutes to talk about brain functioning. And I think that is really the key. I take a neuroscientific perspective sometimes, even when I talk to kids themselves and definitely when I talk to parents, because we now know a little more about how the brain works. And one, the brain develops from the bottom to the top and from the back to the front. So it starts developing with a brain structure that promotes just our survival. And then the last thing to develop is the prefrontal cortex. And I like to call that sometimes the boss of the brain. This is the home of our executive functioning skills. It's planning, organizing, decision-making, prioritizing, self-regulation, self-control, everything that you know, makes us the most evolved mammals lives in the prefrontal cortex. So that develops last. Our brain finishes developing in our mid excuse me, in our mid-20s. So if you think about the children you work with and the children I work with, they're young already and their brains are even younger. However, their emotional brains, which are more in the center, their limbic system, their limbic system as it's called scientifically, or emotional brain as we call them, are fully developed because they are the parts of the brain that need to work on attachment and survival and anxiety, which is an emotion that is intimately linked to survival. And so what we've learned from functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI studies is that when our emotional brain turns on, our prefrontal cortex turns off. It's like the seesaw effect. So when we're very, very emotional in some way and anxious, as we're talking about right now, we can't think. So the saying, I can't think right now, it's pretty literal. You really cannot think. You can't access all of your resources when you're very, very anxious. So when we're expecting kids who are anxious about their performance or anxious about an assignment or anxious about what's going to happen outside of school to complete school assignments or to be able to get organized or to plan or pay attention, then we're asking them to do something that may be above their capacity in that moment to do based on what their brain is doing right then. So if we're, be, if we're able to be mindful of that, we can then use tools that we come up with as parents or their own tools, you know, coping skills that we teach them. And then once the emotional brain has calmed down, be able to transfer functioning to the prefrontal cortex and again, function or focus on, you know, attention and executive functioning and planning. So I think it's very clear that anxiety is this, I think of it as a parasite, it kind of absorbs the resources of the brain and it really focuses them in kind of the wrong place. But it's a very natural thing that happens. And so I hope kids don't feel ashamed or embarrassed about it, but I know they do. They feel like there's something wrong with them. If we can validate it and help them work on that and understand what's happening, they can get back to what they want to do quicker. So they do want to do well in school. They do want to complete their assignments. They do want to do well on tests. And for them to understand and be able to do that, I think would really work wonders for their self-esteem and also for their performance in the end. That analogy of the seesaw, Diana, because, you know, I've seen that too. When, and, and in adults, even when you're in a, an argument with your spouse, when you're upset, it's true that you can't really think straight. And certainly in kids, when they're upset, um, it's almost like their executive functions go offline. So I can see how, okay, you're upset, this is going to happen. And when you're calm, you're going to be able to think more clearly. Mm -hmm. um, so talk a little bit more about executive functions and anxiety. Um, you talked a little bit about what happens to one and the other, but where do you see them merge when it comes to school? Hmm. So there are a few different areas in which this happens. And I think the biggest one is when children struggle with their, you know, completing their assignments. Another one is when they struggle with tests and the anticipation of tests. So a lot of times the kids I work with and their parents tell me that it's not even during the test that kids are um, anxious. It's at home when they're trying to study for the test or when they're even thinking about the test or days and days before the test, they're thinking about a test and they can't focus on the more present concern of the day. And so 
anxiety, it's almost like a short circuit. It, it really impacts across the board functioning, executive functioning, not only in a very specific way. So let's say a test, right? We're saying you're anxious about a test. So you're probably just going to be anxious the day before the test. No, your anxiety, if it's generalized about the test, can impact you for weeks before the one event. Um, same thing with homework completion. Again, anxiety takes your brain, like you said, I like that too, offline. I like that analogy. It kind of takes your brain in a totally different direction. So you may have a plan to sit at your desk for 30 minutes and work, but if your brain is anxious, you could sit at the desk for three hours and not be able to get anything done because you can't recruit those resources. So I think ideally we would be able to lower anxiety and first of all, teach kids what's happening to them. So they understand and they feel more in control because in my experience, kids really feel out of control when they experience these things. And so teach them what's happening, help them lower the anxiety and then help them with tools and techniques because just lowering anxiety is not enough. Help them with tools and techniques and ways to develop their executive functioning skills but in order to use them, again, we do have to work on the anxiety. Well, we're going to get to that in just a moment, some strategies for doing that, Diana. But I have a question from a parent. She typed into the chat. By the way, parents, if you have any questions, throw them in here. She said, when a high-performing straight-A student starts to fall behind on assignments, lacks sleep, but doesn't exhibit any classic signs of anxiety, how could it be diagnosed from your lens? That's a really good question, because the diagnosis of anxiety, if we go by the DSM, which is our manual of diagnostics and, um, um, you know, our kind of go to our therapy Bible, we go to it for looking at symptoms and figuring out what kind of manifestations fulfill those symptoms. A child may not fulfill all the symptoms for a diagnosis like generalized anxiety disorder, there are diagnoses like unspecified anxiety disorder, um, where we look at what are the things you're noticing. So for example, lack of sleep. Lack of sleep is actually a symptom that corresponds to anxiety and also to depression. So from just lack of sleep, I don't know if the problem is that the student has anxiety or depression, but clearly there's lack of sleep that's impacting functioning. So we move forward and we ask more questions about other manifestations. Is it that there's a lack of energy, sadness, or crying, which would be more in the depression arena? Is it that there's some ruminating thoughts and expressed fears or concerns, which would be more in the anxiety area? So I do dig, dig a little deeper to be able to do what I would call differential diagnosis. So to separate what is anxiety versus something else that can impact functioning equally badly, but would need a different kind of treatment. And so lack of sleep in itself without anything else, lack of sleep impacts functioning because of the functions that sleep has for our brain and for our body. So for this specific parent, I would recommend that before they worry about anything else, maybe they try to implement some sleep hygiene and fix sleep and then figure out if there are other things going on and definitely talk to a professional if you have concerns. Kind of professional would that be? I know that you do that work as a psychologist. Could they also see their pediatrician or what avenues do should parents take when they're just first thinking this could be an issue? I think pediatricians are well equipped to do a basic screener and to listen to your initial concerns. So definitely if you don't have a resource already in place, so if you don't have a working relationship with a therapist, I would absolutely start with a practice with a pediatrician and your pediatrician should be able to direct you further um if needed unless again you already know somebody you'd like to work with or try mm -hmm. out margarita says um have you seen any connection between cell phone usage and social media and increased anxiety in kids <laughs> yes <laughs> like where yeah. do we begin right yeah right right i was <laughs> just thinking right now it's yes so and I actually anticipated a different ending to that question. I thought they were going to ask about social media and phone use and executive functioning deficits, because there is actually also a connection between phone use and internet use and this distributed attention. 
and the ability to then pay attention. So attention is like a muscle. Of course, it's not a muscle. We all know that it's not a real muscle, but I liken its function with a muscle. The more you use it, the more you have it. And if you don't use it, you lose it. And switching attention very quickly between tasks, which by the way, there is no such thing as multitasking. And I'm sorry to burst that myth or to un, you know, demystify that concept. There is no such thing as multitasking, unfortunately, for people who thought there was. It's just our brain switching very quickly between tasks. The more we do that, the more we do not hone our brain's capacity to stay focused for a long time on a task because that takes practice. And so cell phone use is basically like a game arcade, right? We have so many stimuli that move very quickly and our attention changes all the time between these stimuli. In addition, we get bursts of dopamine in the brain with all of these stimuli. So it does create a difficulty for sustained attention. Now, in terms of anxiety, I think the social media piece is much more relevant there. So kids, especially in the adolescent stage, so I guess between maybe 11 and 17, are the most susceptible to peer pressure because their um, base of comparison changes from their family and their attachment figures to their peer group. And so it's very, very important what your peer group does, what they like, what they think, and you have such access to that through social media, but in such a, an edited way, such an unrealistic way. And so that can create a lot of anxiety and can, of course, take away from your capacity to then focus on things that are more helpful to you, like maybe your schooling or your, your own pursuits or your own self-development. You, you, know, you focus on other people to the detriment of yourself. So yes, unfortunately, I think as we learn even more, technology has advanced so much faster than our brain has advanced because our brains have not had significant new development in, you know, thousands of years, whereas technology changes incredibly quickly from year to year. So I think we're going to learn a lot more in the decades to come about the true impact of social media access early on. And there is also now research about um, internet addiction at young ages, and it truly is a very harmful impact of very long-term um, exposure to video games and to internet. So um, experts actually recommend, and I'm not an expert in internet addiction, but I did speak with some, and they do recommend actually detox periods and just what you'd expect from every other addiction treatment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fascinating. I, I think you're right. We're going to hear more and more about that. Mm -hmm. I have a question from Erin. She says, how do you help a younger child overcome anxiety to be open to working with a counselor or a therapist? My child is exhibiting signs of anxiety at school, but is scared to go out of the classroom with the school counselor or work with her at all. Hmm. So depending on the age of, a, of the child, and here I'm anticipating a little bit what we're going to talk about later on today, but there is actually now a new, newly developed treatment approach that doesn't actually need to involve the child. It starts with the parent. And at the beginning, and I do this, I don't even see the child. I don't meet the child. It's very good for children who either aren't aware of, the, of their symptoms or can't or don't want to engage in treatment quite yet. So I think parents have a lot to do there if their child isn't ready yet. And so the parents can do their job, their piece, and in the meantime, slowly educate the child and validate and support until the child is ready. That's what I would start yeah. with. And that's a great point. Let's come back to that because we're going to talk about the space program. And I think that that really um, lends perfectly to um, that conversation. So uh, another question, and then we'll take a break from the questions, go back to the slides. But she said, my son, Lily says her son has an anxiety disorder selective mutism. Mm -hmm. He's doing much better, but comes home from school with a very bossy attitude. But the more she reprimands him, the more aggressive he becomes. Any thoughts around that? And I'm thinking anxiety could definitely be playing an issue, um, be playing a role. Since, you know, sitting down and doing homework is the, usually the thing that happens right when you get home from school. Can you talk about that? Maybe the correlation between what she's experiencing, um, the aggression and anxiety. Yes. And 
by the way, she also says that her child is diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. So we already know that there is that foundation there. Sorry, I'm just going to turn on my little heater here. So we know that there's that foundation. Um, and again, I think part of the answer would be the space treatment because I'm hearing already ways in which the interaction is, is fueling the continued emotion in a way where the parents could change that dynamic themselves. But I do think that, um, like you said, you know, so children, a lot of the times, especially children who have big emotions and anxiety can be a very big emotion, have to hold them all in at school. And a lot of them do a really good job holding it in at school and being very appropriate and, and doing what's expected. Also because school does a good job of providing structure. And so they have expectations, they're very clear, consequences are very clear. And so many of the kids with these disorders, anxiety disorders, or other big emotions are able to hold it in at school. And then they come home in their safe environment. Parents hate to say it. Lucky you, you're safe. You're the safe people. So that's where kids let it out. I think there are a lot of, of things that we can suggest. One, the transition from school to home can be done a little differently, especially if we already know there's anxiety and that the demand, the extra demand of, okay, now it's time to sit down and do your homework can trigger an explosive response. So we can change the way that transition from school to home happens. I always ask, you know, have you thought about a snack first? Because you would be surprised how many kids react so much better after they've had a snack and 10 minutes themselves before they have to start doing homework. Um, so that would be one thing that we would talk about. And then also, again, in some cases, you can't control what the child does. They just have big emotions and no, don't know another way to let them out. So the parent is the side of this equation that can be changed because theoretically, they can be more in control of their emotions. If nothing else, at least we know they have a fully developed brain. Even if they're also angry or also frustrated or also tired, at least they have a little more biological resource to draw on. So, Diana, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about those supports. Um, what kind of supports do anxious kids need? I think they need support and understanding, really, from a lot of different places. I think they need, first of all, a lot of validation and a lot of education about what's happening to them. And then I think in terms of specialized support, I think there is a lot of room for a collaboration between therapy and skill building. So therapy to develop coping skills and to help with lowering anxiety and then skill building, which is executive functioning support, teaching literally how to build your own structure, how to scaffold your own life. And I think those two kinds of supports can help lower the anxiety and increase functioning. So let's talk a little bit about um, the one side of the coin, which is um, therapy. Can you tell us about the space program? Yes. So I'm actually, <laughs> I am completely converted to space therapy since I've learned about it and been trained in it and started practicing it. I have seen such incredible results for the families who are able to apply it that I already believed in the principles, but now I just think that's the way to start for everybody because space therapy and space, by the way, means supportive parenting for anxious childhood emotions. I don't know how long it took them to come up with that, but it is a parent-based treatment for childhood anxiety. And the theory behind space, and I'll, I'll, um, I'll say that space has these two parts, increasing support and decreasing accommodations, and I'll, I'll speak in a moment to what it means. But the reason that Dr. Leibowitz at Yale Child Study Center even started developing this program, which is parent-based, solely parent-based is because they notice the difference between childhood anxiety and adult anxiety. So adult anxiety is mostly an intrapersonal process. People feel anxious, they manage it. Adults feel anxious, they manage it within themselves. They maybe find coping skills or do whatever they can to increase their functioning, but they manage it with just their own resources. Children don't do that. Children have an interpersonal anxiety process. So they involve their caregivers into their own emotions. And if we think about it, that starts very early on. So if you think about a baby, right, who gets anxious or scared, what do they do? They don't 
fight the threat themselves or use coping skills, they scrunch up their faces and make loud noises to alert the caregivers that they're in danger. And then the caregivers, of course, are biologically triggered to hear this and powerfully motivated to respond because it's their own survival. Their genetic survival is at stake. And so children and adults, their caregivers together are involved in this cycle of I'm telling you and I'm anxious and you help me reduce my anxiety. And there's also this accommodation cycle. So accommodations mean any behavior we do or don't do in response to our child's anxiety. So all of the help we give our children, they could be termed as accommodations, especially if they become unhelpful. And there's the cycle of accommodations, right? So the child says, I'm anxious about this, help me. The parent provides the help. The child's anxiety decreases. So that's very rewarding to the child. Oh, this worked. So if I ask and my parent does this, my anxiety will go down. It's also very rewarding for the parent. I was able to help. I did something and their anxiety went down or the pressure on me went down or we were able to get out the door because I just did it for them. And now we can get to school on time, by the way, for school refusal or for, you know, all of those morning routines. However, unfortunately, Every time the cycle repeats itself, it gets maintained, right? Because now the child thinks the only way I can do this is if my parent helps. The parent also thinks that. And so they get into these cycles that can become more and more onerous for everybody. So at the beginning, the child just asks you to tie their shoes. Then it's put my shoes on. Then it's get me dressed. Then it's pack my bag and do everything for me in the morning. Feed me. I'm exaggerating here, but you can see how it can get bigger and bigger as the anxiety grows and grows. So space helps parents pull it back a little bit. So space starts by increasing support. And support is a very specific type of communication we give our children to say, I see you, validation. I I see that you're struggling. I see this is really hard for you. And confidence. And I fully believe that you can handle these feelings. So I trust you that you can handle a little more anxiety than you think you can handle. That's the basis of it. I tell you that I trust you. I put the mirror in front of you. And I love the statement that space has. Parents are the mirror that children look into to see who they are. So if I get panicked when you're panicked, then we're enhancing each other's panic. If I stay calm and show you confidence in you and your skills and abilities and strengths, then you internalize that message as a child. So first we lay the foundation And then we work on decreasing accommodations. And again, accommodations are those behaviors that parents do or don't do in response to the child's anxiety. And in terms of decreasing accommodations, there is a step-by-step process. It's manualized and it's very specific and very clear. And it involves making a list of all the accommodations, choosing our first target because we go one at a time, then making a plan. And making a plan is not just making the plan, it's stress testing the plan. That's often the most important piece of the whole process. Because after we make the plan, parents say, yeah, but I tried this before. And this is what happened. And then it all went to pieces. Well, okay, well, let's, let's stress test this. Let's play it all out. And let's figure out how are we going to respond to this. And so we go into very specific detail for anything that they have concerns about. That's stress testing the plan. And then we write what it's called an announcement. It's not a contract. It's not a negotiation. We write an announcement. We tell the child what the parents are going to do because the plan only refers to the parent's action. We don't make the child do anything or stop the child from doing anything. We only refer to what we will do within this plan. And so we write the announcement. It's very supportive and positive and kind and warm and firm. (laughs) And then parents read this to their children because nobody wants anybody to be riffing off of some ideas that were discussed, you know, a week before. We want every word that we've been really thoughtful about to be conveyed to the child. And so after they read the announcement to the child, they start implementing the plan. I'm there throughout or the face therapist they work with is there throughout to support them and to answer any questions. And we have seen, it's kind of like mini exposure therapy. If you're familiar with exposure therapy, where kids get faced with what they're worried about, this is a modified version of that. And over time, if parents are able to manage their own anxiety, which is very normal and also very common, and are able to stay committed to this program, I have seen tremendous results from this. 
let's give a specific example, Diana. Let's say the student won't do their work, um, which I know can be involved because it, it could be school avoidance. It could be um, they don't know how to do the work. Mm -hmm. There's so many different obstacles. But in general, let's say the student um, isn't sitting down, doing the work and turning it in. How can mm -hmm. space mm -hmm. help with that type of thing? So I actually, if it's okay with you, I want to give two different examples, one way in which space can help, but not every scenario like that can be helped by space if the parents don't happen to provide any accommodations. And I would like to also provide an example of how I might try a different way or what a different theory might suggest. So let's say parents do engage in accommodations around this, right? I am too anxious to do my work, but if you sit with me, let's just give the most basic example. And I've had this actually in my practice. If you sit with me, you have to sit with me here at the table and you have to, you know, every 10 minutes, you have to check in with me or answer my question and then I'll do it. But I can only do it if you literally physically sit with me. That is an accommodation. The parent would not engage in that otherwise. Or I can only do it if you provide me my favorite snack and, you know, my favorite drink and all of these things. Accommodations, right? So a behavior that the parent engages in. If that is the case, there are two sides here. One, I would work with the parents on what they can be okay with, because it might be that in our work for a while, might I say this, they allow the student not to complete the work because they will withdraw their accommodation and the student will follow through on what they said. I will not complete the work today. And so in our attempt to support the student in becoming more independent in the long term, we might actually have to suffer watching them not complete the assignment today in the short term, because they're also testing our resolve to go through with our plan. And so in the short term, we might say, okay, let's scaffold this. Let's plan this. I can sit with you for 10 minutes and I will get you started. And then I'm going to go because I have other things to do. And I'm right here. If you need my help, I can come back for one minute at a time. So we can make a plan that looks different and a little bit more relieving and less burdensome for the parent. Again, space only concerns themselves or itself with what the parents do. So if I'm doing space, I'm only concerned with a plan from the parent's perspective. And that's very hard for parents to hear at first because they would say, well, but I want my child to finish their assignment. That's my end goal. For space, our end goal is not for the child to finish this assignment. It is for the child to be free of anxiety. And for that big goal, we may have to let go of this assignment today because that's what's keeping you in this cycle, right? You need the child to finish this assignment today and they need you to sit there with them. And this is the only way they'll do it. And so you're engaged in almost this kind of anxiety power struggle. So we relax the time boundaries a little bit. We say, well, what about long-term? Because if they see that they can do something on their own, they are more likely to do it again. But for that, you need to change something. Now, let's say the child doesn't ask for anything. It's just anxiety that's keeping them from completing their assignment, but they're not asking the parent to help or stay there or do anything. It's just they can't do it. In that case, there are a couple of different ways I would try to work with a parent. One is to suggest that they sit back with their child from the assignment and actually engage in coping skills first. Forget about the assignment. Forget about school first. Let's just focus on our emotional well-being. Because oftentimes procrastination and delays are about emotion coping. They're not about time management. So I would encourage the parents to engage in some coping skills with their child, 10 minutes of sitting back and doing something else, and then trying again, encouraging the child to try again. And lastly, and of course, the options are endless, so I'm not going to go into every possible scenario, but let's say there's just oppositionality. I will not complete my assignment today. I don't feel good. My anxiety is so strong. You know, sometimes anxiety manifests as oppositionality, pushback. And it is still anxiety, but it doesn't look like it. It looks like disobedience or, you know, other Machiavellian <laughs> traits that we interpret our children to have. In that case, we could also present them with a natural consequence. Well, I'm really sorry this is hard for you to do right now. I know you wanted to watch your show later, but if you are having trouble finishing your assignment now, you're not going to have time to watch your show later because time is going to go by and it's going to be bedtime. So can I help you now in any way, like not sitting with you for 20 minutes, but can I help you by deep breathing together for two minutes 
or do you want to take a walk around the room and then you'll sit down and do your homework? Or if you choose to just continue trying on your own, that's totally fine. But I'll be sad if you don't get to see your show today. So trying something like that. And again, these are very quick with families. When I meet individually, it's about their family, their expertise and their own children and what will work for them. Because some families have told me, I know you say these are research based. They're not going to work for my child. And I said, okay, well, let's, let's problem solve together. You tell me when we hit on something that will work for your child, because it's not just one size fits all. We have to find something that will work for you. Otherwise you won't do it. And that's not the point. Thank you for that, Diana. Um, some other common issues that we see, and, and we'll get back to the questions in just a moment, are this relationship between perfectionism and anxiety. Do you see that as well? And how do you address it? I actually conceptualize perfectionism as a, man as a manifestation of anxiety. So perfectionism is one way in which anxiety manifests, just like you know, selective mutism or school avoidance or test anxiety. Perfectionism is this, um, it does have an intersection with self-worth, right? And with the self-development of your identity. But perfectionism is this idea, if I don't feel like I can do it perfect, I'd rather not do it at all and face that than face the anxiety of doing something that's imperfect. And so perfectionism definitely can lead you to not finishing a product because of the anxiety that comes from the idea, it won't be perfect. It won't be to the standard that I want it to be. So that's why I conceptualize it as a, conceptualize it as a manifestation of anxiety, because I think it's intimately connected. If you aren't anxious about the results of your work and you felt peaceful and confident in your self-worth, then your concern about it not being perfect wouldn't come into play to decrease your level of functioning. So perfectionism can truly have an impact on, on functioning because it prevents you from finishing work, even though you have the capability, you have the intellect, but there's that anxiety coming in, that perfectionism telling you if it's not perfect, it's not worth it. Uh, and there has to be an overlap too with procrastination. Tell us a little bit about that. So interestingly, you know, procrastination used to be um, looked at as a time management issue. So people thought if I could only get a handle on, if I could just plan it well enough, then I wouldn't be procrastinating. And now new research is showing that procrastination is actually an emotion coping deficit. So even if you have the executive functioning skills, now, if you don't have them, you need them. Absolutely, you need them. But they're not enough. They're not sufficient to help you get over the hump if you have emotion coping deficits. Because procrastination is, again, about the anxiety of having to do it. And I'm trying to avoid that anxiety by not doing it. But in so doing and delaying, my anxiety about doing it just grows, grows, grows. And it gets so huge that at the tip of where I can't handle that anxiety anymore, I start doing it. But oftentimes, it's too late. So let's say Let's say I have a project due in two weeks, right? And I try to avoid even thinking about that project because it's anxiety provoking for me. So I don't think about it and I don't do anything about it. Instead of dividing my work in 14 little chunks and doing it a little bit every day, I just don't do anything at all for a week. And then I think about it and I'm saying, oh my gosh, now I'm only a week away. I don't know how I'm going to do it. So I'm just not going to think about it. That's procrastination. Again, I'm avoiding the emotions. I'm avoiding facing the distress. So I get to the day before. And now I've reached the peak, the tip where my distress about not doing it is higher actually than my distress that I can anticipate having while doing it. So I'm starting it, but now I'm only a day away from the deadline. There's no possible way that I can finish it, even if I work 24 hours. So by procrastinating and having this emotion coping deficit, even though I, was, I would have been totally able to do it, I ended up with a project that I couldn't turn in because it wasn't completed because of my anxiety that kept me from doing it. And for that explanation, that's really helpful, Diana. Um, we're going to go to questions in just a moment, but you mentioned the role of therapy. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role of executive functioning help and mm -hmm. how that could be a solution as well. So just like I said with procrastination, that just having the skills is not enough. 
unfortunately, just having the emotion coping skills is not enough. So once you are able to calm down the limbic system, right, to get it to lower levels of activation, then you need to know how do I recruit my prefrontal cortex? What skills do I actually need now that I can access them? What do I need in order to be able to complete this assignment? And anxiety treatment is not a substitute for emotion, for uh, not for emotion, for executive functioning skill development. Because once you're calm, you still don't have that scaffolding and planning and all of the things that are involved in actually completing the assignment. The emotion coping skills can only get you to a place where you're ready to do the work. But then in order to actually do the work, you still need the skills. So it's this symbiotic relationship. You, one is not enough without the other. This is kind of going back to that seesaw we talked about in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, the, the anxiety is the piece of the limbic system. And so therapy takes care of that. And then executive functioning is the piece of the, or the, you know, the factor of the prefrontal cortex and executive coach or executive functioning coaching takes care of that. So ultimately it sounds like Diana, that parents have a lot of power in all of this, that they yes. have the power to make change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's why, that's, I, that's why I do what I do. Yes. Because I strongly believe in this. It feels like such a positive message that, you know, it's it's honestly hard to get your kids to change. I know I, I found that with my own kids and lots of kids I've worked with. But really, the solution can lie with parents. A hundred percent. Yes. Parents, one, can start face treatment, for example, if they identify their children as having anxiety or if they notice that their children are struggling, parents can take the initiative and not wait for children to say, I need help do this for me, but, you know, schedule an appointment with you or with me or with somebody else that they think is a good resource that can support their children, but they can take that initiative. And then instead of even asking their child, Hey, what about this? They can say, Hey, I noticed that some things that you want to do are, are hard, are harder for you. And I've scheduled a meeting with somebody who might be able to help us figure out why. And so it's not, about, you know, becoming the warden of your child, but at the same time, you are right now responsible for their well-being. And it's a heavy responsibility at times and children will fight you at times, but I think it's very, very important. And leading to that, I want to give everybody Deanna's contact information. Um, you can scan the QR code to find more about Deanna and her work. Um, and this is her website, and you can also um, give her a call at Georgetown Psychology. Similarly, we're here to help you too. If um, you feel the need is an executive function, and in addition to therapy or one or the other, um, we can certainly help you with an executive function coach. That is what we do. And I have three program managers, Kathy, Jennifer, and Ann Stewart. And this is what they specialize in. So they can talk to you. Um, you can scan the QR code and set up a call and we'll talk about your child. So Deanna, thank you so much um, for joining me tonight. If it's okay with you, I'd love to go to questions. Yes, thank you. It's my absolute pleasure. This is one of my favorite topics to talk about. So thank Aww. you so much for having me. I really appreciated the invitation. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, all right. So a couple of questions. Do you have recommendations for a middle schooler who has social anxiety to the point where she won't return calls to friends, even the friends that she likes? She's social with cousins and family, but has a lot of anxiety around peers. There aren't any bullying um, concerns. So since I've been exposed to space, I always ask if there are accommodations. So are parents doing anything to maintain this behavior? Or is this one of those rare cases of completely internalized anxiety behavior where the child doesn't ask or not? I shouldn't say internalized, but individual anxiety behavior where the child themselves is just acting on their feelings rather than asking for anything from the parents. And if that is the case, um, I don't know what the child wants. So is this a child who wants to be more social and can't? I forget if you said that. Did you say she wants to be more social, but she can't? Or that 
there was no information in the question. She didn't really say. She just said to the point where she won't return calls even from friends she likes. So I have to think. So friends she likes. Right. Okay. So in that case, I do think it's important, again, to one, validate the difficulty to, to start discussing what's happening and to give a lot of psychoeducation about anxiety and about what's happening to the child so that the child doesn't feel what's wrong with me. Why can't I do this? Because I see that in almost every single child with anxiety that I see, they're starting to question what's going on with them and then what's wrong with them and then help with some um, coping skills for those feelings, knowing that there is a way for this child to live according to their own values and not according to what anxiety wants them to do. So I think of anxiety as actually separate from the child. Anxiety is one voice and the child has different other voices too that wants different things from the voice of anxiety. So it's not like, this is what my child wants. It's just, this is what my child does because anxiety has the strongest voice right now. So that would be a very brief answer, not knowing any more details. I hope it helps though, to get you started on the road of figuring out how to help your daughter. Catherine asks, you mentioned that children and adults procrastinate because of anxiety and it isn't always about executive function deficits. How can you tell the difference between anxiety versus poor executive functioning being the reason for procrastination? In other words, how do you know which one to address first? That's a really good question. And I think I would look at performance across settings, across preferred versus non-preferred activities, and um, also across time. And so um, were they ever performing better and did something change? Are they performing better on a subject that they like, or they feel more confident in, are they saying they want to do it and they can't for some reason, and they don't even know why. So I would, I would gather a little more information, um, ask some questions and differential diagnosis is usually about figuring out, you know, is it just, I don't want to, because I want to play video games, which is actually not, of course, it's not anxiety in that case, or is it, I want to, and I can't, or I'm too anxious or upset to do it. Um, or I don't know how I'm calm and relaxed. I'm not anxious at all. I just don't really know how to start it, in which case that is much more likely to be a skill deficit. So if you find out from your data collection that it is more of a skill deficit, then I would start with executive functioning. And then if you see that there's still a barrier, go into more of the emotion coping. But if you see that there's anxiety manifesting across settings um, or that performance differs, then I might start with the emotion piece and then move into executive functioning because even then there might be um, some need for some more skill building. Thank you for that. Keisha asks, what's the best way to manage a child with ADD and anxiety, especially when the medication wears off? Mm. Yeah, so I, I actually... I hear that a lot with evenings being very, very difficult because kids benefit from the results of the medication while at school and then at home, it gets very difficult. And I I will say that in rare cases, and this has to be discussed with a doctor, I'm in no way making any medical recommendations here, but I know of cases where um, psychiatrists were able to suggest either different medications or extended release medications or a different medication regimen so that it covers more of the day. Otherwise, I think it's very, very important practice. Again, coming back to that, you know, muscle of emotion coping practice is a muscle. If you continue to practice it, you have it. If you don't use it, you lose it. So I would have routines in place. I would make the afternoons and evenings very, very structured, very predictable. And here again, somebody like you, Anne, who's an executive function coach, um, can really help create that structure and that routine. And then in order to implement it, how I would work with a parent is to figure out how to overcome the resistance from the child, because the child is not going to like the change in routine or in, you know, the lack of routine to a routine. So I would create structure and routine. I would make sure I practice emotion coping all the time. I would make sure I have a snack if they need a snack um, and kind of work with them with their energy instead of providing opposition and resistance all the time, because it might make your life as a parent easier to do that. So figure out what strategies you can implement that work with what your child is giving you at the end of the day, because it's really, really hard. It is. It's really hard. And ADHD and anxiety are kind of an explosive, very exhausting combination for the child and for the family. 
Jennifer asks, my 16 year old daughter was diagnosed with anxiety, PTSD, depression, et cetera, and has been in therapy, DBT and CBT for almost two years. She has anxiety going to sleep. And of course, lack of sleep creates more of her issues. Would space be able to help? Only, and I will say this is a pretty kind of clear um, way in which I decide who's, or I tell parents to decide, or I decide what's a good fit. There has to be parental accommodation in order for space to be a good fit. Otherwise, there are other ways to address behavior modification and support of an adolescent. But in order for there to be a useful contribution of space, there has to be a parental accommodation in place. So let's say she has trouble going to sleep. So she asks you to sit with her for half an hour every night, or she has trouble going to sleep and she uses her computer, then you could shut down Wi-Fi at night in the house. And, and this might seem very kind of a big step and we work on it in small steps, but if there's something you can do, then there's some room for space. If there's nothing you can do, then we can, we can work, look at other techniques, but space is only a good fit if there are parental accommodations in place. Karen says, my son has anxiety, which has turned into task avoidance at school, particularly in writing and sometimes math. His teachers want him tested for ADD. I feel stuck and in my gut, I think it's his anxiety rather than ADD, but can they overlap and where do I begin? Um, and also, I think it's interesting that it's math and writing, um, which take a lot of working memory. Can you talk a little bit about that, Diana? Yes. So I always am, if you have the possibility, I always like more data rather than less. I'm a data driven person. So I like to find out information. So I, I never think that testing is a bad thing because I also like to know what the strengths are and how we can build on them and know where the areas of growth are and how we can support and enhance them. So if you can get some testing done, I would absolutely get it done. And I would include an emotional battery of tests. So to figure out, is there anxiety going on? Is there depression? Is there ADHD? Is there what, you know, what is there and what can we find out? So I would go ahead and do the testing if you are able. It's hard to know why it's happening. And did you say that you find it interesting? It's math and writing? I, or? I did. I was just right. giving so that commentary. So why don't you speak a little bit about that? Because I think it's a very interesting um, observation you made. And, and I think you're right. Well, I just wonder, you know, because the, the subjects are math and writing, and they're so correlated with working memory and working memory isn't your short term memory, it's not your long term, but it's your ability to keep things in your head, while you're processing information. So like in writing, if you think about it, it's, um, oh, I have to, you know, use proper punctuation, spell the words correctly, say what I want to say, um, make sure that I'm sticking to the prompt use enough good vocabulary, um, use rich, rich words, all of those things that are swirling in your mind. So if you have weak working memory, which is an executive function skill, you're really going to have a hard time in writing. And it's those same skills that are in math. So I love your idea, Diana, of like really peeling the layers back of the onion to figure out um, what is going on, because it could be ADHD. Um, since it's particularly since it's those two subjects, it absolutely could be. And there's so much overlap one between anxiety and ADHD, but also so much of one being confused for the other because they can have the same impact. So guess what also impacts working memory, anxiety, <laughs> anxiety severely impacts working memory and ADHD <laughs> that can impact working memory. So it is very hard to tell just by this one snapshot what it is. Um, and I think more information is indicated. Yeah, I think anytime I agree, testing is expensive, but it can also really be super helpful. All if right, it impacts um, just, his school performance, by the way, just as a small parenthesis, if it impacts his school performance, they might be able to get it done through school, just as a if it, if he's in public school. Just to throw that out um, there. Yeah, we have two uh, two minutes left, so just real quick, um, Tara. Uh, says a suggestion is to help a military kid who has moved around a lot and moved to DC this summer. He had a really hard time. He will be in class and anxiety will rush over him so badly. He will need to leave class because he will start crying. 
You know, I actually worked in my postdoc with military families from Fort Meade when I was in Maryland doing my postdoc. Um, so I totally hear what you're saying. And I think there needs to be some therapy there because it's not only about his school performance. I think it's about a lot of things connected to his moving, his uprooting, creating and losing a circle of support, especially in these years when peer groups are so important. And I think school is the setting in which those get triggered because that's where we spend most of our day every day as children. And that's where we create our friendships and that's where we feel stable. And he was repeatedly kind of uprooted from that environment among all the others. So I think in that case, I would recommend at least consulting with a psychologist or a therapist, getting an intake and an interview with a child, kind of exploring this a little further um, and supporting him that way. Because I think there's a lot of emotion there that may not have been able to be expressed. And I don't know how the conversation goes in the family, but you all had to move and he might not have feel, felt comfortable talking to you about it when you might have been suffering too, that you had to move and uproot. So I think he might need a little more space for that. Thank you. Um, and I'll end on this question. I have a 15 year old girl who is angry at me and her dad and her sister all the time. Could it be anxiety? She's very nice to her school friends, only angry at us. She would get angry at me even over sipping tea. Well, I will, <laughs> I will end with the answer. It could be, but that is such a common thing I hear. And the, the answers, the reasons vary so widely. So I do a lot of family therapy and I actually specialize in family therapy among a few other things because I love working with systems. And I have right now in my practice, several families of parents and one adolescent where we work all together as a system. And you would be surprised at how many varying reasons there are for this behavior. So it absolutely could be anxiety because anxiety often manifests as anger, but it could also not be anxiety. It could be something completely different. It could be something you did and don't even know. It could be something that she might have misunderstood that you didn't even really do, but she thought you did. It could be her own hormonal changes or emotion changes. It could be depression there are so many things that it could be that it's absolutely impossible for me to be able to tell just from that information. But I hope it helps to at least show you the, the spectrum of options that it could be. Thank you, Diana. And we have so many other questions, but we're oh, out of time. Oh, I feel time. bad that I can't answer them all, but it's I so okay, appreciate but everybody's We'd love to have you back and we'll talk again at another date um, because this is clearly a really important topic. And it affects a lot of families, especially in our area. So thank you, Diana, for joining me this evening. Thank you, thank everybody, you. for coming out tonight. I hope that you found this to be helpful. And, oh, don't forget, after um, I, I log off, there will be a survey that will pop up. And I would be forever grateful if you would take a moment to complete the survey um, to let us know what you liked and how we could um, improve with topics in the future. Thank you everybody this evening, Diana, you're the best. I really appreciate it. And um, I wish you. everyone the best in the remainder of the school year. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye-bye.